What's your name? Dominic Latkovsky. What's your occupation? I'm a sports entertainer. How would you describe the superstars to somebody who has never seen them before? Superstars are a group of inflatable characters performing dances, tricks, acrobatics, choreographed goofiness at sporting events all around the world. Well, if you've ever seen the superstars before, then you're nodding your head and you're smiling and you go, oh yeah, I've seen those guys. Those guys are hilarious. If you've never seen them, well, it's probably because you haven't gone to enough sporting events. And coming up on this edition of Life Around the Seams, we visit with Dominic Ledkowski, the founder of the superstars, exclamation point at the end, to learn how this act was born, what it's like seeing the world through huge inflatable animal characters based on famous athletes, and how it's become a family business. This is Life Around the Seams. Former Major League pitcher Jim Bountain once wrote, You spend a good piece of your life gripping a baseball, and in the end, it turns out it was the other way around all the time. Welcome to Life Around the Seams, a podcast about baseball people who have interesting stories from between the lines, and sometimes even more interesting stories outside the lines. Here's your host, Josh Sushan. All right, Dominic, thanks for joining me here from the winter meetings, the trade show that you have attended. You've just packed up. How many years now for you attending the baseball winter meetings trade show? Oh, goodness, Josh. Okay, our first one was in December 92. This is December 2018. So I'm always bad about trying to figure out, like, when the twin year, there's 20th anniversary, 25th, and you count this year and the next. So it's like 26 years, more or less. Something like that within a year or six. This has become quite a, a what a life, what a career. So let's let's kind of go back here. If you were say like age ten or twelve, and I was your mom or dad or your yep. teacher or guidance counselor, and I would have asked you, what do you want to do with your life when you grow up? What would you have answered? Well, at the time, I, I would not have known what I would have said. I was going to be a professional basketball player or a professional soccer player or something, because of course I would thought I was really good. <laughs> And I was, but I'm, I wasn't, I was decent. I was halfway decent enough to get a partial division two soccer scholarship. And that was about, about it. But just after 12 years old, around 13, 14, my older sister uh, was dating a guy who was the mascot for the local minor league basketball team in Louisville, the Louisville Catbirds. And so uh, I was hanging out with him quite a bit and hanging around him. And of course would go to games with him and, and see what he did, and this was also right around the time of the the San Diego Chicken doing all of his shenanigans and becoming very popular on this week in baseball and everything else that he did, and and um, and this guy, my my sister's boyfriend Danny, he he was really good at what he did, and and I was his side, not a sidekick, I was his assistant. I was carrying his bags around and helping him out at, at shows and things at his, his gigs and. And I thought, man, you know what? This would be really fun to do something like this for a living. So I think as early as 13-ish, 14-ish, I thought that this was something that I would like to do. And then what about going to minor league baseball games at Louisville? Yeah. You go as a kid, and you see, did you see yes. Max Patkin oh, yeah. and the chicken? Yeah. And, yeah? So that, that further established that into my mind. So in 82, so I was born in 70, so in 82, 12 years old, the uh, the Louisville Redbirds came to town, and Louisville was starving for minor league baseball. We didn't have a minor league team for for a number of years, and so when it came back, Louisville was the first minor league team to draw a million fans, and and it was a big deal. And um, so I was out there with my family for every my, my brothers, my dad. You know, my dad was an umpire, a basketball referee, and he we, we would go out to every single. I was at every single game, and so. We'd go out to the Louisville Redbirds game, and we'd sit down, sneak down, and sit in the front row right above the dugout, and we'd, you know, get to know the players and the the, the coaches and the ball bat boys and all that stuff. And so, going to every single game, 
I mean, I remember being at all the games, but the games that I really remember, and I can still see, you know, clear as day to this day, is when Max Patkin is out coaching first base. The clown prince of baseball. Clown prince of baseball. Featured from Bull in Durham, Bull Durham. Bull Durham. And, and, uh, and then uh, the San Diego Chicken would come into town. Morgana the Kissing Bandit. Dynam- uh, Captain Dynamite back, back then as well. And I can remember all those special events. You know, I, I, I remember a lot of the games, but I don't remember specific things about the games. And I remember a couple little giveaways here and there. But I remember... You know, those those uh, vivid memories of the traveling acts that would come to town. And I can see Morgana running across from the right field, right, right field corner across and calling timeout and going out and kissing the third base, uh, third baseman, you know. And so so those are the things that I thought at that time, like, man, that'd be so cool to be in Louisville tonight. Evansville tomorrow, Columbus, Indianapolis, wherever, and just travel around and perform. You ever talk to any of them and to kind of learn about the business, or how did you get started? Back then, no. I was 12, 13, 14, and I didn't, at that time, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't set in my, I didn't have it set in my head what I was going to do. Fast forward a few more years, so then, so I was at Redbirds games. I probably didn't miss but a handful for the first three or four years, but then I got, 15, 16, that age where, you know, you get in, involved with, uh, uh, you know, friends and, and girlfriends and and uh, doing all kinds of soccer stuff and diff- different things in my life. And so I was doing, going to the games less at that, at that age. And then when I got to uh, college, I saw my dad actually noticed it in the newspaper that the Louisville Redbirds were hiring a new Billy Bird performer because the... One who the guy who had been doing it, Billy Johnson, who now lives in Las Vegas, oddly enough, uh, he was retiring from doing Billy Bird. He had done it for several years, and so they were looking for a new Billy Bird. So Dad's like, "Hey, there you go, Dom. There's your, there's your shot right there." And I was busy soccer, working three jobs, trying to pay for college, and and place you know doing all these different things, and went out, tried out for the job, got hired to be Billy Bird, and uh, I think I was their second choice. At least that's what they told me. The first guy that they wanted declined the job. They called me like, hey, you you got the gig. What's the tryout like? It wasn't really a tryout. It was more just an interview. I I went out there and told them about, you know, my 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 experiences with uh, Danny, the the gorilla, the the gorilla for the the cat birds. And I didn't have to get in a costume. I just talked to him, told him about some skit ideas. Told him my, about my infatuation or uh, uh, you know love of what the the chicken and Max Patkin and Morgana and what they were doing and and uh, just told him how much of a big sports fan I was and that I was a class clown and I was a goofball and and I could dance and I could do these different things and so they they called and said hey all right you're in you got to st- you know we got the first game tomorrow night and we need you to come and pick up the costume and drive out to the costume lady's house and get the, pick these the feet up and do this and get this rep- so next thing now they're like yep yeah. and and how old are you at the time of your first game in costume i was 19 You're 19 years old if you don't 19. mind me asking how much money did you make $35 a game 35 a game is this a lot at the time are you excited or are you just well, happy I, to do it one of my uh, my other jobs that i was working i was making minimum wage so at the time it was 3 Three eighty-five an hour, I think. So I was working at the homemade ice cream and pie kitchen, and I was working overnight as a as a valet at an apartment complex, a fancy apartment complex. So, so all of a sudden, I'm going to be working three hours and making thirty-five dollars. So that's over ten bucks an hour, and I'm going to get and I get to go out on the field. And I'm at ball games, and people are asking for my autograph, and and I get to act like a goofball, and people clap and laugh at me, and I'm like, yeah, this is so much better. And I was refereeing basketball because our dad, my, my, my dad was a basketball referee, and so we were refereeing games and umpiring and doing all that stuff too. And at those games, people, they yell at you like they don't, they don't like you. Right. Yeah, they don't like you. So now I'm at games, and people are clapping, and they're laughing at me, and they want my autograph. So I like that a lot better. The first time, the first game, you, you put on the costume. You go out there. What, what are some of your – are you nervous? Are you excited? What are some of your memories about the first time that you're performing? Well, I remember thinking that I couldn't see very well out of the costume. Now, th- and gr- granted, this is a costume. This is the thing that, you know, we can kind of get into down the road. This is a costume that the San Diego Chicken and or his mom, I guess, made for the Louisville Redbirds. So Billy Bird didn't look all that different 
than the San Diego chicken. I mean, it was red, but it had the same style, the same beak, the, the eyes were made. You know, the look of it, you could say, it looks like the, the chicken's cousin. Okay, so I'm, I'm in this, this Billy Bird costume, and, um, and, it was, and it was cool, but I couldn't see very well out of it. So that's what I remember, first of all, when I got in it, like, okay, I can't see very well out of this thing. But, it, you know, this is the costume they gave me, and i got to make the most of it. And what year was this? This was in April of 1990. April of 1990, and you just told us that the first time you went to the winter meetings was 1992. So mm-hmm. describe between 90 and 92 what you're doing before the first time you go to the winter meetings. Well, you, so I go out and this, that first 1990, April 1990, I started the job and Billy Johnson, who was the mascot before he, like he was, he was really good at it and he was good at getting publicity for Billy Bird and, and everybody thought that he did a really nice job, but he had, I guess, was ready to move on and move on to other things. Whereas here I am 26 years later and I'm still doing it. So he, he was ready to move on and they hired me and, and right off the bat, People are like, wow, you know, you're really good at this. You're, you're good at, you know, you're doing a good job. You're doing great. And I was like, oh, thanks, you know, appreciate it. And I was just giving it my all. And I was, you know, sweating, sweating every night, losing weight and, and you know, just going balls to the wall, if, you, if I may say so, and, and just going nuts. And people, but people said, hey, you're really, you, they kept giving me praise. And, and my boss was like, yeah, we're going to pay you more next year. And, and so, um, then a f- couple of fortunate things, you know, that looking back on it, these were the things that really helped springboard us to, to success. And in 1991, Louisville hosted the AAA All-Star Game. So the next summer, Louisville hosted the AAA All-Star Game, which, of course, you know, I knew it was a big deal. I didn't know how big of a deal it was. I didn't know that the Edmonton Trappers uh, general manager and a couple of their people would be at the game and the Albuquerque Isotopes and, or excuse me, Albuquerque Dukes, Pat McCurden, and, uh, uh, you know, people from all across the country, all the AAA teams would be at that game. I didn't realize it at the time. Again, I'm only 19 or 20. I'm worried about, you know, my girlfriend and scoring goals at soccer and, and signing autographs for little kids or whatever. I didn't realize the whole, how, how big of a deal it was. And so, but I remember before that, now, so I'm kind of jumping around here, but doing in 1990, we started doing Billy Bird. When I say we, my brothers, my brother, Brennan, who's my, been my partner at this business for so long, but also my older brother, who's just helped us here and there over the years. And, and then another guy as well, we were all doing little routines. So, so they would do the Blues Brothers as part of my act. And then they would do the dancing umpire routine, which was our dad's creation. They, he said, hey, borrow one of my uniform umpire uniforms and go out on the field. And then you guys bust into one of your dance routines. So they would help us with skits. And then when the All-Star Game came around, my boss said, hey, make sure you put on a really good show. You know, do some of your good skits and stuff. Because he knew that they they were going to have a big crowd. It was on national TV. It was on USA Network or something, some cable channel. And and, uh, so we did. We put on a big show and good show. And, again, still I didn't realize at the time how important that was going to be. Then the next year, 92, winter meetings. And and talking to my boss, they gave, you know, they paid me more each year and, he said, hey, if you're ever going to make a go of this, traveling, doing your shtick on the road, you know, the winter meetings are coming here. Put, get a booth, rent a booth, get a booth, put a video together, let the world know, let, them, let everybody know about you. Did I read correctly that you scalped tickets to a Garth Brooks concert in order to raise the money to get your booth? Right. So I come from a humble background, like dad worked his whole life he he would work go work as at the career journal newspaper and he you know worked you know whatever normal normal type jobs and there was four kids and um and then one there was times where dad might have got he got uh um, let's see let go from from one of his jobs and there was a time where we were on food stamps even so i mean there was a it's not like we we didn't come from a wealthy family at all so i always found ways from when I was in school, I would go buy Jolly Ranchers for two cents and sell them for a nickel and make money at school. And then in high school, I would go to the Sam's Warehouse, which is like Costco, and buy uh, boxes of Twix and gummy bears and Snickers. And I'd walk around school with a duffel bag and sell the candy bars for 50 cents that I bought for uh, a quarter. So I'd go to school and I'd make 10 to $20 in a day when I'm walking around the high sc- my high school making money because that way I have money. I, yeah. you know, I didn't have money growing up. That was cool for me. I'd go to school and make money at the same time. 
So, so I found ways. And then, then for, around 14, 15, 16, I'd go out to a ball game, and I'd stand out front and scout, scout tickets. Somebody would walk in, I'd have my hand up, and they're like, oh, this kid needs a ticket. They'd give me the ticket. They'd walk in. I'd turn around and hold the ticket up. Somebody would walk up and needs a ticket. Instead of them paying $20 for the ticket, I'd sell it to them for 15 bucks. Like, hey, you know, I just made $15. I could do that, you know, do that a few times, and now I'm 14, 15 years old, and I'm making $100 standing in front of a, a, a concert, a, a basketball game, a baseball game, whatever. So I, I started learning, yeah, how to do that. And then I, Prince is coming to town, or Tina Turner, and, and I'd go buy tickets and, and scalp them. And so, but Garth Brooks was, was my big, yeah, I made, a lot of, I made a lot of money selling Garth, scalping Garth Brooks tickets in the summer of 92 with that money. I invested in the trade show booth, the video, the uh, marketing materials to launch Billy Bird and Company in December of 92. $6,000 was what I had put up on the line. It's a lot of money. A lot of money for a kid who's 22. But I was entrepreneurial. I was ta- I'd take chances. You know, I'd, you know, it was not that big of a deal. And I, I had, I had uh, belief that we could, we could get at least four shows. And we were like, okay, let's try to get some teams to pay us $1,500 to do a show. The chicken at that time was making seven, $8,000 a game. Wow. Yeah. Okay. You know, and he was, and he'd come to Louisville and he'd come to Louisville three times in the summer. So he'd come in May, he'd come in June and July once, you know, and they would be packed and UPS, Kentucky fried chicken, Ford, Pepsi, somebody would sponsor it. This is what my boss taught me. He's like, yeah, you know, this, these, these big companies will, They'll pay to sponsor the chicken, and then we'll give them a whole bunch of tickets for their for their um, employees. So then the Ford and UPS employees all come out to the game. The chicken puts on a great show. They pay to, for the chicken to appear. Chicken makes a lot of money that night, and everybody's happy. It's like, so you're hoping to get four shows in your first trade show. I'm hoping. You're hoping. Man. And how many did you get? 48. 48. Yeah, so the trade show opens. And we're, we've got our booth set up, Billy Bird and Company, the new bird on the block. Okay. Taking direct. And aim. the company's your brother. My brother and I and our, our, third, our third guy. Uh, so now my sister, this is going to sound bad on my sister, but now she, this is another guy she's dating. And, and he's, he's doing uh, the Blues Brothers act, Jake and Elwood, with my brother Brennan. So they would do, Jake, they would do the Blues Brothers, and I'd be in Billy Bird, and we'd go out and do a little, a little Blues Brothers bit as one of our routines. But he's, he's, uh, he's been in... He's been, he's worked at pawn shops and he's worked sold used cars. So this guy knows a little bit about business, right? He's a wheeler and a dealer. This guy, and and here I am still just a 22 year old goofball entrepreneur, but I didn't know how to necessarily have business dealings. So he's with us and and we open the trade show booth. The the trade show opens, and we've got our booth set up and uh, we got our video with our highlights and. Hoping for the best, and the doors open, and here come all the baseball teams. I don't know what to expect. I've never been to a tra- baseball trade show before. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know what the heck's going on. And all these people start walking in. They stop and they see our booth. And they're like, "Yeah, we saw you at the AAA All Star Game last year. You were great. You guys were great and stuff." All right, what's your, how much is your fee? Great. Okay, good. All right. Yep. Can you be in Edmonton on July twenty second? Yep. Hell yeah, we'll be there. Can you be? And then, hola amigo, cómo estás? Todo bien. Oh, muy, muy, muy bueno. Buen show. Yeah, in Monterrey, Mexico, in Abril. You know, my bro- so my brother Brennan, my partner, he can speak some pretty good Spanish, and I, I can butcher it enough. And and next thing you know, we've got a show booked in Monterrey, Mexico, on April twenty first. There, and then, you know, Medicine Hat Canada, and Asheville, and Clearwater. And, are you still doing the Louisville home games? I was still doing the home games. So that so Louisville gave me permission to do Billy Bird and Company for every day that they were not home. They're like, yeah, you can just make sure you're here for all of our 72 home games, and then book your shows around our uh, home games. So that's what we did. So so when Louisville was home, we couldn't do book shows. But then when they're on the road, we'd hit the road. And now looking back on it too, Josh, it's crazy. We did those 48 shows. In addition to the seventy that I was doing in Louisville for the Redbirds, so looking back, I did a hundred and twenty something games, whatever it was that that summer, and just you know do all the I mean, it's crazy just to think flying all over and yeah. How do you go from that show to Bird Zerk? So Billy Bird and Company, Billy Bird was the Louisville Redbirds mascot. It was this was their costume. We were they let us use it, and we were getting Billy Bird out there and. 
and you know, for most of the teams, it wasn't a problem that Billy Bird was the Louisville Redbirds mascot. But like Indianapolis or Iowa or Columbus, they didn't necessarily want to hire the another Triple A team's mascot to come entertain their fans. So, so that didn't help that we were affiliated with the Redbirds. And the Redbirds at that point saw that we were on to something, and then they wanted us to sign a contract saying that they were going to get a big chunk of the money that we were making. And then we, once we kind of talked about it with one of our – my buddy, uh, an attorney and whatever, it just made more sense to break away from the Redbirds completely, from Billy Bird, and just start our own character. Not too dissimilar from what the chicken had gone through with the Padres mm-hmm. back in the day when he was the Padres mascot or, and then broke free and, and from, from whatever he was contracted with and started out as a, as a free agent. So – that's when we're like, okay, we got to leave Billy Bird behind, and we got to come up with something different. And that's when we created Bird Zerk. What's it like creating the costume? Who who does that? Whose idea? Color schemes, uh, philosophies? Well, it's not too different from this room that we where, where we did it. A room like this, we we invited all of, a lot of our friends, a lot of the people that knew what we did and what we wanted to do. We invited them to a, to a little get together and said, okay. We're leaving Billy Bird. We're going to create this Birdzerk character. And we actually, I think we didn't know the name at that time, Birdzerk. It was, um, you know, we didn't know. We just couldn't knew we had to leave Billy. We couldn't call it Billy Bird anymore. And, but we, I didn't want to also then go and become a, uh, a gorilla or a, some random character like the fanatic, just some unknown thing. I wanted to keep something birdish because after now, after three or four years, with this costume, I was familiar with the costume, and I you can w- see now. I can see. I learned how to, you know, adapt so I could see, and yeah, I, I learned how to figure that out looking through the beak and and all that stuff. And um, so we had everybody get together, like, okay, what are we going to call it? Let's come up with some names. What kind of bird? And and what is it going to look like? And so we got crowns out and markers, and people like started drawing stuff. We, you know, and, and next thing you know, we came up with Bird Zerk. Made sense to us, a bird, berserk, you go crazy, and, and uh, hip, you know, in, in kind of hip hop, off the wall goofiness. And in um, and the colors, we, you know, I don't know, we just came up, that's just what we came up with purple, green, and yellow, and when dreadlocks. It com- when it comes to the different skits that you come up with, is it a similar thing? First of all, how much alcohol is involved when you're coming <laughs> up with the skits? Uh, how much food is involved? And so, uh, let's try this. And, and who do you practice it on before you do it at a game? That's a great question. And that's where the, that, my training, my, my time as, as Billy Bird, that all helped get that going. Because it was dad, our dad who said, you know, hey, get out there and do – let Brennan be an umpire, ask the umpires before the game, say, hey, in the fourth inning, do you mind, third base umpire, do you mind sliding out behind second? And Brennan slide out of the dugout, and, and you guys, you know, come out and do your thing, and nobody will notice there's another extra umpire on the field, and then by that time the place will be going crazy, and they did. So dad, that was Dad's creation. Then we just implemented it, and, and it worked, and the friggin' place went bonkers, and, and we were like, okay, this routine works well, and that was, that was our signature routine. Then Dad's like, hey, he figured out, uh, like, hey, take have one of the infielders take a glove out onto the field for warm-ups one inning and then come out and mess around with him, steal his glove and go out, throw his glove over the wall and let tell the guy just act it up. Right. You know, and, and, and so my first guy was Razor Shines, famous yes. minor league. Yeah. Great guy, still see him. You know, he's coaching, great dude, and he would always clown around with me uh, back in the day when he was playing and I was Billy Bird and – and he did it, and and everybody, you know, people lost it. They loved it, and and so you know, and then then we do other skits that that would bomb, that would, and and my boss at the time, Dale Owens, who who passed away here recently, he was uh, an amazing boss, and he was always telling me, let's do, let's do the crazier the better, let's mm-hmm. try stuff, do stuff, let's go, you know. So he was always, you know, and and then and we he, you know, stuff would be great at the end of the game. He'd be like, oh, he come in, high five me, pat me on the back, great job, you guys are great, and whatever. And then other times, you know, we'd try something and it would fail and it would flop and and it wouldn't work out so well. And he'd come back and he's like, yeah, and he and he would laugh just as hard at the one that failed. And so it wasn't like, man, Dom, you really screwed this one up or whatever. You know, he's like, all right, whatever. You know, we learn from it and let's try something new. So he was always pushing me to to do stuff. And then. 
uh, another guy that was working in, for the Redbirds at the time, I, uh, his little t- two or three year old son was a, just a cute, the cutest little kid. And, and, and he loved Billy Bird and he could dance a little bit. He could sh- you know, do these little moves. So I took him out on the field one time and, and just did a little back and forth dance with him. And he's tiny. And, the, and it was just so funny. And w- so that was the start of our Mexican hat dance, bird zerk dance that I've been doing ever since with little kids. And we go out on the field and do our, our routine. And the kid at the end takes his shirt off and flexes his muscle. And I steal his shirt and run off the field. And so that's been a big routine that we've done. So all these little routines. And then since then, you know, we've, we've um, come up with other ones. And we've done some that have worked and some of them that haven't. And you figure out what works and... To me, to me, that's part of the, the fun and the spirit of minor league baseball is we're going to try, and we might fail. And yeah. if we fail, okay, so what? Learn from it. We'll learn from it, and we'll continue to figure out what does work and, and what does not work. Um, how hard was it to convince Brendan, your younger brother? Did, he, did you have to uh, convince him? Did he want to? Did, was he, please, please let me do this, or what? As far as a willing participant? Yeah. Oh, yes. My, Brennan and then my older brother, Lex, and then this, uh, the other guy, Mike Hamburg, who was our uh, third partner in Billy Bird and Company. Uh, those guys were always on board, and they were you know, willing to, to dress up as a grounds crew, ball player, umpire, whatever, and, and do the, uh, you know, get water, a bucket of water splashed on them or uh, you know, get tackled or, or – Brennan dress up like Morgana the Kissing Bandit himself. You should see him. Yeah, with a big long wig and balloons in his shirt. And, I mean, it, oh, it was yeah. You know, and and he'd come out on the field, and then, uh, you know, normally that shtick Morgana would get arrested for running out on the field. Well, Morgana ran out on the field and did something, and I was I, he ran out and kissed me. Billy Bird is what it was, but then Billy Bird got arrested okay. instead of Morgana. Okay. The, had the cop come out and arrest Billy Bird, and so you know we're doing stupid stuff like that, and and, it, and then. Um, it was always so much fun and, and so so silly and so so stupid. But Brennan was always up for it, and and so he was always right there, ready to to assist and and play the role of the of the uh, the sidekick. And and uh, yeah, and here we are, still working together twenty eight years later. Okay, and now the primary act is the is the superstars. Mm-hmm. The first character was Harry Canary. That's right. And again, this is your father's idea. That's right. Your dad's pretty smart. He's very smart. He's very smart. And, and so, how did how does he what what does he say? How does he pitch Harry Canary to you? So, we do Bird Zerk. We launched Bird Zerk around '95, and we do Bird Zerk for a few years. And we added uh, Air Bird Zerk, one of the inflatable, the first real inflatable character that kind of the the, to the minor leagues saw. And we had seen the Nebraska Cornhuskers. They had an inflatable character that we saw at a cheerleading competition. And that's where we launched Air Bird Zerk. So dad, uh, after doing Bird Zerk for a few years, he's like, guys, uh, yeah, you need to let, – let, why don't we get just ditch Bird Zerk and let's start over with Harry Canary. Just get rid, get rid of Bird Zerk and let's come up, get a new character, uh, Bird, you know, not too much – different than bird zerk a bird but put you know white hair and big glasses and let's call him harry canary and you'd still do your routines but then in the seventh inning harry canary goes up with a big fake fake microphone and leads everybody with the seventh inning stretch and we're like yeah you know and he he was pushing this idea on us and we're like ah dad bird zerk's good you know there's there's nothing wrong with bird zerk you know people like bird zerk and this harry canary idea it's it's okay whatever but we kind of like yeah whatever dad and we didn't we didn't really like, like put put much thought to it, but he persisted. Thank goodness he persisted. And around right about that time, that, those inflatable characters, we we had a, another friend now uh, who was doing a uh, a character uh, uh, costume inflatable costume character at the Louisville Cardinal football college football games in this all sport bottle. And the team was terrible at the time. So when the all, inflatable all-sport bottle, you know, Pepsi product character would come out onto the field at whatever time each home game in Louisville, that would get the biggest ovation because he'd come out and he was really, really funny at it. And he could do some funny stuff and and people loved it. So in working with this guy, we launched the Superstars. And because Dad's persistence with Harry Canary, Harry, Harry Canary, we said – Okay, well, let's get let's make Harry Canary inflatable, and then let's not only make just Harry Canary. Let's come up with some 
some more characters. And let's come up and we start thinking and like uh, Ken Giraffe, yeah, Ken Giraffe Jr. And then uh, Shark McGuire, Cal Ripken, Cal Ripken, and Pee Wee Geese. Those you know the original five. And okay, yeah, those are all those are all funny. We'll get all these different animal characters, names, characters, and and then this guy, um, you can go you can go traveling around doing that while Brennan and I do Bird Zerk, and then you can do this, and we'll call them the uh, the baseball bunch or the uh, the baseball crew or something and like ah, it didn't really sound good and then we had another meeting and we all got together and came up with superstars yeah that's it superstars that sounds good so superstars were born and it was those five characters this guy was going to go do it because he was funny at it and we started working on routines and the show what's going to happen and then it all culminates with harry canary singing the seventh inning stretch and like it goes back to yeah we had some skits back then that were good and then not good and we figured out what works and I'm going to ask you about my favorite skit, which is probably your most famous. But before that, did Ken Griffey Jr. ever meet Ken Giraffe, or did Cal Ripken ever meet Cal Ripken? And what was the reaction of the athletes when they saw their likeness? Okay, yes. Both of them know, uh, are well aware of it. Because, and and we, we don't ha- because what we're doing is parody, we don't have to go to those people celebrity athletes to get permission to do what we're doing we're making fun of them when they're famous athletes when they're famous celebrities they give up certain rights for people to make fun of them pair and do parodies so our attorney said as long as you guys stick to doing entertainment and you don't make ken giraffe dolls or cal ripken t-shirts and try to sell them using his likeness to sell a product you can do your entertainment so we didn't have to go get permission from them but cal ripken of course as you know ends up owning minor league baseball teams in Aberdeen and, and, and on and on some other teams as well. Ken, Ken, and, and every time we, that Aberdeen would hire us, they'd say, Hey, make sure you bring Cal Ripken up okay. here, you know? And then, and it was cool because we'd go up there and we'd, he'd be there and we'd meet him, you know? And, and of course he knows about it. And he did a routine with bird Zerk one time and have a 15 minute conversation with Cal Ripken. Like I'm sitting here talking to you. It's like no big deal. Right. It's, he's cool as heck. And he was great. And he liked, loved Cal Ripken. Ken Giraffe, I never, I never met Ken Griffey, but he obviously knew about our show and our characters because when we did a show in Cleveland for the Indians, they were playing Cincinnati, and his family was at the game, and he sent word down with some kind of an employee, hey, make sure we want Ken Giraffe to come up to the suite where my family is to take some pictures and stuff. Okay. So he knew about it and liked it enough to request us to come up to the suite. Anybody ever get mad? Dick Vitale did not like Dick Flytow. Okay. So we did a we did a um, some kind of a uh, a, sh- a show. We did a performance at a, some kind of conference that a business conference. It wasn't a game that he was a speaker at, and then the superstars were there as well. So it was sports themed that for the employees. And uh, we had Dick Flytow there, and Dick Vitale saw one of our guys. He's like, "Hey, don't you guys have to get permission to do something like that?" And we're like. No, not because you're famous and we're doing – it's just a parody of you and no, we don't. So he he wasn't particularly happy about it. But then later we went and did a Tampa Bay Devil Rays game and he's a season ticket holder. loves it and sits in the front row and we got a picture with Dick Flytow and Dick spraying silly string all over his bald head. (laughs) He's laughing and and stuff like that. So And then uh, let's see, Nomar Garcia Parra likes Nomar Garcia Parrot and he's been interviewed about it and – let me try to think of it. I, oh. I mean, if, at least from my perspective, like that's when you know you've made it, when the superstars <laughs> par- you know, do a parody of you. That's what Nomar said, exactly, in, in the interview. when He's like, you know, that's when you know you've made it. And we actually have Nomar's wife, Mia Hamster. Okay, that's yeah, right. So, Perfect. So, so, so he's, got, he's got the bonus with, with the wife. But in Roger Clemens, we have Roger Clemens. And so now we've done – a, a several events with where Roger Clemens, when he went back to the Sugarland Skeeters and made and did pitched for them, they hired superstars to be there that game. And then we've gone back and done some of his celebrity softball games back in Texas and Oklahoma, where they have the big Red River Red River rivalry games. And he, and he's so cool and he's so awesome about it. And we've got a picture of Roger Clemens with Roger Clemens and Sugarland after he had pitched underneath the stadium in the batting tunnels and stuff. And Roger Clemens is sitting there in that photo 
getting his picture taken with Roger Clemens, and he's like a kid getting his picture taken with Santa Claus or right. Easter Bunny. He's so he's got the biggest smile, and he's pointing like, "Hey, I'm getting my picture taken with Roger Clemens." And it's, uh, so it's you know that's it's it's cool to 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 know that those guys all they like it and they appreciate it. The skit in which the weird Al Yankovic song "Eat It" comes on, and one of the Zooper stars basically eats another, eats a bat boy, eats a ball boy, spits him out. Describe how this skit came about. So in our early years of Superstars with the characters, and we were at a dance studio practicing some of our routines and turning the music up and just trying to do fun stuff. One of the costumes, it was um, Clammy Sosa. He had some kind of a small hole in the mouth so that we could, I think, Originally, the idea was just to spit out a baseball or a bat or a glove or something out of his mouth after he could eat something. Well, one of our guys, one of our younger performers was a really skinny kid. And the hole we was big enough for like a kickball or something to come out of. And, and the kid's like, you know what, I think I can squeeze through there. And we're like, no. And so sure enough, you know, we we tried this and... and and the, and the kid was able to, to to go through the little trap door uh, into the costume. And, and when he did it, it was just so funny looking. The, the visual was hilarious. And so then we started talking to the, man, the, the guys who make our costumes. We're like, okay, we just need it a little bit bigger. And here's what we're going to do. And, and so that's where, that's where it all started with the Eat It routine. We put the, the Eat It Al Weird Al Yankovic song to the routine. And then from there, that was a grand slam, that, that routine. Yeah, that's... I, I remember the, the first time that I saw it is probably the first time for a lot of people when they see it and they're like, wait a minute, what's going on? They're, they're eating, <laughs> wait, wait, this inflatable superstar is eating a human? Yeah. <laughs> and then he gets spit out and he's basically just in his tidy whities yep. and he's running off the field. That's and that's it. when I totally lost it. Yep. That's our, I mean, that's the one everybody loves, of course. And so every time we do that, that gets the biggest laugh and... and was there ever a time over the last 26 years, 28 years, whatever it's been now, in which you thought, uh, this is it, you know, it's, time, you know we, we, it's gone as far as we can go, and it's, it's run its course? No, and, and I, it's never, I, I, that's never, we've never hit that point. In my mind, because while you've seen us a lot, and while those season ticket holders at the isotopes have seen us a number of times. The, the ones who don't miss games, you know, they're there every single game. When we come to Albuquerque and we do a game for you guys at the isotopes, and let's say there's 8,000 people there, you know, that's what I think about is how many of those 8,000 people have seen us before? And I'll, I'll ask you, you know, you're, you're here asking me all these questions. Let me ask you, when we come, so let's say we're going to be there in June, and we come to a game June 15th, of those 8,000 people, how many have seen superstars before? What would, what would you guess? At max, 500. 500, max. okay. So, um, but maybe, maybe even less, because maybe. most people go to anywhere from one to three minor league baseball games a year. So there might even be less than 500, unless they saw you on America's Got Talent or they've right. seen you somewhere else. Yeah, they, maybe they saw us on, on one of the shows that we've done. But let's even go and say that 2,000, let's quadruple your prediction and say 2,000 people have seen it. Well, those 2,000 people that have maybe seen us before, they go, oh, the superstars, here they come. They watch, this guy's going to fall down, and this guy's going to, watch, he's going to flip over, he's going to bounce on his head. This, oh, watch, this one, okay. Well, I've seen this before. They're going to eat the guy. Well, you know, that can be their attitude towards it, and like, oh, I've seen this before. Or they can go, hey, you know, they're sitting there at the game, and the person sitting next to them, maybe they've never seen it. So they know what's going to happen, but the person sitting next to them doesn't know what's going to happen. And so every game, there's 8,000 people, there's 4,000 people. There's people who have seen us before, and there's, but there's more people who haven't seen us before. And that's just the nature of what these sport, sports games are. So while we try and we strive to come up with new characters and new dances and new routines and new, new shticks and, and, and the whole thing, there, there's also people who want to see us eat the bat boy you know they want to see the bat boy get eaten so if we didn't do that if we did went to albuquerque and did a show and didn't do that routine it'd be like going you going to the jimmy buffett concert and him not singing margaritaville <laughs> and the concert is over and the lights come up and you're leaving like what the heck yeah he, he didn't sing margaritaville play you the hits yeah play the hits i don't want to go there and listen you know when you when i go to a concert i don't want to 
listen to somebody. Pl- All right, here's a new song off our new album. Man, heck with that. I want to play the songs I can sing <laughs> along to. <laughs> right. I want you know. So it's it's and and we learned that from the chicken because we used to you know the same thing back in the day. Well, the chicken's going to do the little chickens, and he's going to coach first base, and he's going to do that. You know, he's going to do that. But you know, you can't cre- you. You know, that's his show. That's what he's created, and that's what works. And then you mix in a, a new song here or a new routine here and there, but you do the you do the hits. And so I guess your original question, is there ever a time where you're like, okay, it's run its course and and it's we're done? No. I mean, really, it's, it's not. It's just a matter of I think the thing is going to – maybe at some point down the road, there's going to be a time where I'm like, okay – I don't have the desire or the love to do this anymore. And the, but here I am 28 years later and I still love going and I still love seeing the staff in in Albuquerque Adam and John and and the grounds crew guys and 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 now know now that I know you and come upstairs to the press box and stop in and say hello to you or any of the other uh guys. you know we've known we've met so many people over these years the players the coaches the umpires and 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 I love to travel, and I love to come to Albuquerque, and the fans there in Albuquerque, you know, that those fans get into the game. Like, they, I don't know what it is, but they they make noise, and they cheer. And some places you go, and it's like, hmm, you know, like, you know, I don't want to name any names, but, like, it's kind of the fans don't really make much noise, or they're just kind of lame. Or I mean, NBA games. We go do NBA games, and, and they, you know, they just don't, they don't, the fans don't really, they're too cool. They spend too much money to sit down low to, to clap and to say like, oh, I don't want I don't want to clap for these inflatable characters. So I don't know. It's just, it's, it's kind of weird, but the, we enjoy, I still love it. I love doing it. And I know when we go do it and you hear the crowd reactions that it works and that people enjoy it. And the main thing is I know at the end of the night, when people leave the stadium and they're leaving, they're going to be like, that was a great, we had a great time at the game. We enjoyed that. I'm going to always remember seeing. And I want these people that are at the game to remember the superstars or Bird Zerk or B-Boy McCoy, Russian Bar Trio, B-Boy uh, Bucket Ruckus, any of our acts. I, I want the people to, to leave not knowing the players, what happened with the score or whatever, but like, hey, I saw the Bat Boy get eaten. I saw Bird Zerk throw the third baseman's glove over the wall. I saw Bird Zerk dance with the umpire. That was great. You know, that 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 I want that memory to stick with them like I've – got the memories in my mind from Morgana, Captain Dynamite, etc. What is a non-sporting event that the Superstars performed where you had to pinch yourself that you can't believe that you're actually doing this here? Well, I'd say America's Got Talent. Mm -hmm. You know, when they called us and said, we want you guys to be on America's Got Talent, I'm like, okay. I had heard of that show because we were in, it was the third year that we got to do it, um, year three, season three. And they called and said, we want you to be on America's Got Talent. And, and I'm like, well, you know what? I've heard of that show, and I know it's a pretty big, popular show. I, don't, I didn't really, hadn't really watched much of it, but I'm like, that would be cool. Yeah, it would be on TV. And, and so when, when we got to do that, and it was 2008, that was pretty cool. I mean, it was, it was a neat deal. It was just the fact to, to fly to Los Angeles and go to Hollywood and then make it past the first round and then go to Las Vegas for the next round and – and then to go and, and now you're in all these rooms and hanging out with all these other entertainers who are good singers or they're acrobats or magicians or whatever they might be. And you're, you got all this downtime just to get to meet all these people that do something similar to what you do. And, and then to see how a big television show is produced and made and all that goes into it. And, oh, hey, there's, and you sit there and you're talking to Jerry Springer and it's just <laughs> – like he's nothing like – and then you go over here and you film something and then all of a sudden David Hasselhoff walks in and he's like, ah, Superstars! And like, hang on, David Hasselhoff knows about Superstars and he's like, you guys are great, oh my God, you guys crack me up, you know? And, and, and so, it, it, I mean, that, all that kind of stuff is – it's cool and, and all the people that you've been able – we've been able to meet from doing this. And um, so that was a pinch me moment, I guess, would be America's Got Talent. Uh you gave a shout out to Dance and B-Boy McCoy uh, a couple of moments ago. Uh, explain this, the, the other spinoffs and how Dance and B-Boy McCoy uh, joins this group of characters. He's with us here in, in Las Vegas, and it's uh, 10 years ago where exactly here in Las Vegas where we first met him. He was on America's Got Talent that same year. And as I said, we're, we're sitting around in rooms like this where 
we're we're superstars. We've got all of our stuff over here in the corner, and then the Russian Bar Trio. Those guys are over there in that corner, and there's probably a hundred different people, a hundred different acts, dance teams, and like I said, magicians and comedians, singers. And there's this little shy guy over here in this one corner, just all keeping to himself. And you know, he doesn't have anybody with him. He's he's a solo act. He's 18 years old. He's real quiet. And at some point in time, while we're all sitting around these rooms, just wait, you know, we're all, we're, there's a lot of waiting when they're making these TV shows. So they have, you know, get the, all the production stuff lined up and how they're going to do this and that. And, and so I just kept noticing this kid, this 18 year old kid. But then when, when it, I don't remember how it came about where like we all just kind of started doing funny stuff in this room. Cause we were all just getting giddy and we we're tired of sitting around doing nothing. And we, we started doing silly stuff and he he gets out and he starts doing what he's really good at this dancing that he can do this unbelievable dancing that that was really impressive to me and he did it and everybody loved it and he was really good at it and he was funny a funny guy and but he's really quiet really reserved so um we go then it was time to go down to to eat at the planet hollywood we all go down to the buffet to eat and our superstars all five of us guys are there and and i look over and and he's there all by himself again i'm like man poor guy so i like motion at him like hey why don't you come over and sit with us or whatever and and he did and and we just start talking to him and hanging out and learning more about him and and like yeah yeah you're really good at what you do like i think you could win america's got talent he was that good at it. i thought i think he's that good and and um come you know come find out he's an 18 year old kid lives in atlanta and all he does is he does this dance and stuff with his buddies, and they do it on the streets, or they do it here and there, and he, you know, he doesn't make a living at it or anything. I'm like, you know what? Uh, we're going to be doing a show, a baseball show in Rome coming up in a couple of weeks because we were we were filming the show. We were flying in that summer in 08. We were doing tons and tons of games with Bird Zerk and Superstars, and then we would then have to fly to Las Vegas for three days of filming and then fly back and then to Los Angeles. And so we were all over the country, barely getting home at all, uh, trying to do all of our shows. And I said, we've got a show in Rome coming up. Kenneth, Ken, and his name is Kenneth, um, how about you come up to from Atlanta? Why don't you drive up and I'll put you, I'll get you into the show, the Bird Zerk show. I'll figure out how way, you know, to do what you do. And he's like, yeah, that'd be great, you know. We'll get you in front of, uh, you know, so, so that, that's where it, I said, and I started just start trying to think of how can I get, how, what he's good at, how can we get him involved in our show and implement him into our show in some way? So we did. We got him in Rome, and then we were doing an all-star game up in Carolina Mudcats, and he drove up with his dad and did that one with us. And, and then the whole concept of B-Boy McCoy, like he's a breakdancing bat boy, and, but because his stage name on America's Got Talent, was exclusive so that's that was his his dancing name exclusive but i didn't think exclusive would work like at baseball games like you know like if if whatever team says hey come to the game tonight and see exclusive it just didn't really work so i thought okay well if we're going to do this we're going to make you a dancing bat boy what can we call you and let's come up with this persona and so i was throwing ideas back and forth off from some of the different minor league people that we knew and what do you think about this and that and they helped come with, they helped us figure b-boy mccoy was was a good name that was the name that's a very good one that, that makes me wonder you know you're at a trade show this year and like you have been since the early 90s and there's a lot of different acts that are trying to get the attention of of executives of whether it's minor league whether it's major league whether it's universities it can be very competitive there's only so much marketing dollars what is what is the camaraderie as you're all trying to get your, you're trying to get shows? What's the camaraderie like within people in this industry? Okay, so you mean within our group or our group as well as any of the other yeah, acts? Yeah, any of the other there? acts. Okay. So Dave Raymond uh, was the Philly fanatic, and then after he left the Phillies, he had an, an act uh, that he started called Reggie. And um, then there's been. I mean, you know, there's a bunch of people who see what we do and think, oh, I, I can do that. I, that's, that's easy. You know, I see what Bird Zerk does. It's, you know, they're not that good, you know, they think, or they're not any better than what I am, and so I can do that. So they come to the winter meetings. And I can tell you, in 26 years, we've seen a ton of them come to the winter meetings, 
think that they can do a traveling act. And, I mean, the 26, 26 years worth, whatever it is, there's there's none there's no other acts out there. The chicken has come and gone. You know, uh, I mean, there's I could I've, we've listed thirty or forty of them probably over the years that are coming that 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 they think they can do it or that and then it just doesn't work for whatever reason. Not to say that they're not a talented performer, but it's not just about being a talented performer. You've got to do, you've got to be able to sell the show to these teams. Like you said, there's limited marketing dollars and limited budgets that they've got. They're going to do fireworks. They're going to do bobblehead giveaways. They're going to do this and that. And if they want to spend money on national acts, they want a good one. They're going to want something good. Do they want to spend money, top top dollar, on some unproven act that's going to come in and not be good or that's going to bomb or that's going to be, you know, not show up or, or something like that? So I feel like we've done a good job of, you know, be, not only being – good at doing the act but doing all of the business side as well the marketing yeah but and i also think that because you continue to come up with new athletes and new names that you can keep it fresh not to mention those who are the performers you're continuing to add new performers that have that have the energy and the desire and they know the standard that you've set how many members of your family are now involved in this entire production of all the different acts well right now it's just my brother and i brennan brennan and i who brennan who owns the business with me that, that's it. Our older brother is still in a pinch. When we like absolutely need something, he'll come back and do something. But he's he's got other stuff going on now, and he's busy, and he doesn't, you know, he's not looking to go to, on to fly to Albuquerque to to do a one Saturday night and fly back. Um, so he's not really helping. So as far as the family goes, it's just my brother and I. That, okay. That's it. And it, at this point, my sister has helped us out with some, some different things over the years. And, of course, Dad's given us the inspiration on a lot of routines, and he's always there for us giving input and in, in his two cents worth. But do other people come up to you and say, I want to be a performer? I want to yes. be inside? Yeah, and actually a lot of – not a lot. I've got minor league ball players who have told me that. Triple A Really? Guys. Yeah, yeah, triple A guys. Is there any names you can throw out there? Um, there's, a, there's a guy, this guy who um, – he had a dance battle with B-Boy McCoy in, at the West Michigan Whitecaps a couple of years ago, and he was he was incredible. <laughs> and, and he gave B-Boy McCoy a run for his money okay. as far as being able to just really good dance. And they did a post game like a little dance off. Um, uh, Burgos, uh, uh, what's his first name? Uh, Berg, Burgos, uh, Alex Burgos. Sorry, it was what comes to me. Alex Burgos is one who's a minor league player who. Who wants he he says, hey man, I'd love to do something like this when when my playing days are over. Okay, there is another one. Uh, there's been a couple of them who who honestly say, yeah, I want to do that. A major leaguer, Lonnie Macklin, who played for the St. Louis Cardinals, uh, you know, who played in Louisville, and I first met him back in the early '90s. He many times he's like, come on man, I want to come back and work with you guys. You know, <laughs> I mean seriously, there's there's guys who would love to do. The, this job but luckily we have got we have a good staff and the the guys who do it they stick around and do it for it's not like you know we don't have guys who just come in and do it for a summer and leave we have we've got our core seven or eight guys who do most of the shows and um and they're good at it and they're great people and they enjoy what what we get to do i mean i, I it, we're, we're honored we're we're fortunate to get to do what we do travel around make people laugh and get to see the country or how many shows a year would you say you average not well, just minor league baseball but everything across yeah, the board so it it's it's it, it kind of ebbs and flows so you know from a high of two, over 200 250 with all of our acts and all that stuff and then if it's dropped down maybe down to 150 so between bird zerk and superstars i know myself i'm on the road about a hundred days out of the year, so I'm gone from my family almost a third of the year, which is a lot. And and so when people say, "Well, are you guys doing as many shows now as you were ten years ago?" No, we're not. But it's not such a bad it's not such a bad thing. Right. I mean, because if I was, you know, you, yeah, I can't just do more and more every year. Because if I did seventy, and they're like oh, next year you're going to try to do eighty or ninety, no, no, I'm really not. I don't. I want to be home. I want to. I like to go, and I like to go home. I like to go out on the road. I like to fly somewhere. I like to go see somebody, see my friends, and see these teams, and see these coaches, and umpire, you know, all these people, and connect. And 
And I like to make people laugh and make it a great night at the ballpark. And then I like to go home and, and hang out with my family. Or Any injuries for you or your brother doing any of these skits inside these inflatable costumes? Inside the inflatables? Um, we've, we've had our share of injuries with our crew. Uh, we had a guy, after he got spit out in his underwear in Norfolk, go running down off the field, s- sprinting down into the Norfolk dugout, not realizing that, that there's a big concrete overhang and cracked his head oh. straight up on the Norfolk concrete and had to go to the hospital, get stitches, couldn't couldn't go the next day. So we had to fly a new guy to the next city to meet the next other guy so they could do a show. This guy had to fly home because he was conked out. Um We've had a guy hurt his shoulder, separate his shoulder. I got punched once in the nose back in my Billy Bird early days by uh, Coach Don Long. Why did he punch and, you? Uh, it was part. Of, it was I wanted him to because I had beat the little girl around the bases in the base race. Instead of letting the little girl win like most teams do, we do it where we win the race, and then we act real cocky and awesome like we just beat that little girl. And while the crowd boos. And then we go to the coach and try to get the coach's praise, and coach is mad, upset, and I'm like, okay, smack me across the beak. Well, he punches in the beak <laughs> and just hits me straight up in my nose, knock me out, and uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure I got a concussion because the next day I remember just puking all day, <laughs> like like that was a concussion <laughs> yeah, for sure. Was a concussion, yeah. <laughs> this was in '93 or '94 in Midland, uh, so yeah. It, I, we and then another time I broke my thumb doing a routine where I fell off of a bike when I was trying to crash a bike and I broke my thumb. So, yeah, I've had my share of, of injuries. Thank goodness nothing major. And but uh, yeah, it, it happens. It does. It, you, I mean, and I, my body. I'm 48, but I can feel it. Like all these Pratt falls, all these things that we've done over the years. I can feel like okay, it's starting to kind of catch up. Yeah. So th- that's what I was just thinking, and and, and where I was going to go next is. It's one thing where the fans are still cheering, the fans are still excited. There's new people who haven't seen you before, but at a certain point, your body can't take, can't take it. Well, I mean, I'm I'm not there yet, but I can feel it when at the end of the night, when after doing the Birdzerk show and it's 95 degrees in Albuquerque and it's hot as heck, and, and then you go up and you sign autographs and it's a packed house and everybody comes by and you're doing autographs for an hour. And then you go downstairs and you take the costume off and you and I'm just dripping with sweat. I was thinking, and, how much weight must you lose? Yeah, well, on those hot nights, I, I mean, I don't get on a scale before and after, but I know it's it's several pounds. Yeah. And um, and so then, you know, by the time you take the costume off and you sit there down down by the dugout or the locker room wherever you are, and and then you try to get up again, you're like, man. I can. I mean, I can just feel it. I mean, I. You know, I, I can feel it. And then the next morning, you can feel it. And then what really stinks is then you get to Albuquerque and and you do all that. And then by the time you load out, and then you go out to the car and you load, and then you want to go get something to eat. And then you go over to what's my famous little restaurant there by the hot the university over there on the the famous Albuquerque spot there. Oh yeah. Uh, um, what's uh, frontier. There you go. Front. Go to the frontier and get some ranchero, whatever. Some green there. chili. Green chili. There you go. And do that. So we got to do that every every city we go to. Go to the famous spot, and then you do that, and then you go to the go back to the hotel, and then you air the costumes out and spray them down with Lysol and put them in front of the heat, the air conditioning unit, and and then it, now it's after midnight, and you got a six a.m. flight, and you got to get up at four so you can drive to the airport, and. So you sleep for three and a half hours, and you get on a plane. You sleep for a couple more, you know. So that I mean, you do that two or three days in a row, and you're pretty beat yeah. by the time you get home. And then, um, so yeah, my body definitely, it, I can feel it. So I don't know how many more years as far as that goes, but I'm I'm in pretty decent shape, and I try to eat well, and I don't you know party too much or drink too much. So I I try to take care of myself because. Uh, that's important doing what I do. And I, I, people are like, well, why don't you just stay home and just send the guys out? And I'm like, it's just, that's not as much fun. I like to go. I like, I'm a people person. I like to go and see things and, and talk to them and catch up with everybody. And that's, that's, just, that's what I do. I don't know. Well, what you do, what your brother does, what your staff does is remarkable. It is fun. It is uh, very unique. And uh, 
keep doing what you're doing because I've always enjoyed watching you guys, and I've seen you guys in a lot of different cities, a lot of different venues, and it's always fun. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I appreciate that, and it, and it's great to get to meet you and know you here over the last couple of days, and and I'm honored. Thank you very much for asking me to do this. I like doing these uh, these podcast talks, and so thank you. Um, and I'll be looking for you, just like I look for all my radio buddies now across the country when we go somewhere, see who who the Albuquerque Ice Tubes are playing. So you're playing New Orleans, and get to see Tim Grubbs up yeah. there, or whoever it might be. And so uh, yeah, so now I'll, every time the Ice Tubes we see you on the road, I'll look up, come up in the press box, and see you, and say hello to you, and. Ask you how to pronounce your last name. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic. Su- such on. <laughs> such on. Suck on. Suchon. What are, what are, what are, Suchoni. What are, what are, sushi. 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 I like sushi. Sushwan. I like sushi. Just sushi. <laughs> Dominic yeah. Letkowski, who created superstars with an exclamation point. Once mm-hmm. again, thank you so much. Yeah, buddy. This has been fun. Let's do it again. This is Life Around the Seams. Mm-hmm.